Okay, hi Ian. So I wonder if we can first start um, just with a general question. If you can tell me about the evolution of Canada's Food Guide. Yeah, Canada's Food Guide um, actually started during the Second World War um, and its, its original name was actually Canada's Official Food Rules. Um, and it sort of came out of perceptions during the Second World War that there was a wartime nutrition crisis, um, mm -hmm. specifically that uh, Canada's soldiers, Canada's industrial workers, Canada's mothers weren't getting enough to eat and that it was having a negative effect on the war effort specifically. And so the food guide was developed as, as a kind of um, means in which to teach Canadians how to eat properly so that they'd be better fit for fighting a war. Okay. And can you speak a little bit about since those food rules were introduced, how it's now changed to an, a guide? Well, it's, you know, the, the evolution of the, the food rules into a guide, you know, at first it was much more of a semantic change because the it, it started in 1942 as Canada's official food rules. Um, they took the word official out in 1944. Um, but up until the 1960s, it remained Canada's official food rules. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the elements of it stayed the same um, um, throughout much of its history. The, the original food rules, um, there were six rules. They, they gave you very specific advice about what to eat, you know, how many pieces of bread, uh, which specific kinds of vegetables, um, you know, how many eggs to eat, those sorts of things. And as it went on originally, it, it really did remain quite specific. It wasn't an entire guide to um, all of the foods you're supposed to eat. There was this idea of protective foods. Um, these are foods that are particularly nutritious and that all Canadians should be eating. And then once they eat those foods, um, then they can eat whatever they want on top of that. And so it was really based on, you know, not this total diet model, but but on this model of protective foods. And so giving Canadians a, a guide to, um, you know, what specifically they should be eating to ensure they get all their, their vitamins and minerals in particular. You know, you could imagine there are a lot of problems with this, uh, in particular because, you know, the cultural model of telling Canadians really which specific foods to eat, how many pieces of bread, um, you know, how many tomatoes, um, this l is going to look very much like the, the, the cultural references of the types of people who wrote the food guide and the types of people who wrote the food guide were white, uh, central Canadian wasps who, who mm -hmm. sort of assumed that their model of, of a dietary culture applied across the country. And, you know, as we know, it, it really didn't apply to, uh, many, many, um, recent and new immigrants who are living in Canada, but specifically to Indigenous people, you know, up up through arguably to, up, up to the present even, the, the food guide really hasn't reflected the actual dietary practice of Indigenous people. And if you look at Inuit diets in particular, the food guide always pathologized in, Inuit diets as being inadequate, fundamentally. And, and as we know, nutritionally, that's incorrect. And this is sort of one of the legacies of, of the food guide. Hmm. And do you find that the new edition, the 2019 version of Canada's Food Guide, is more inclusive? There is there is an inclusive element to it, but particularly when it comes to the North, if you look at the Food Guide and ask someone in Nikaluit to to eat according to the Food Guide, for most people it's actually impossible. And so hmm. when you're presenting. Um, a model of eating that is impossible to large groups of people, and particularly um, large groups of, of Indigenous people, then you have some fundamental problems you need to start asking questions about. Of what does it mean to do food guidance? You know, why does Canada have a food guide specifically? And, and it's worth asking, you know, how did a, a guide that was developed to... Um, to combat a wartime emergency of malnutrition or a perceived wartime emergency of malnutrition, how did that become the model that then was kept in place up until, you know, arguably the 1990s when, when they adopted a, a total diet model? 
you know, what does that mean about our understandings of nutrition that this perception of an emergency of malnutrition um, was able to stay so similar for such long periods of time, specifically when, um, you know, the type of malnutrition that they feared during the Second World War, which it turned out um, their fears were much uh, uh, overblown, but what does it mean that that was the model of food guidance, even as, you know, different types of, of dietary practices proved to be much more problematic than, than for instance, not getting enough vitamin C, um, the rise of obesity, the rise of, of chronic um, illness like type 2 diabetes. And so it is a question, you know, that's worth asking and, and why, why it's important to study the history of food guidance is to ask the question of why and who is this helping specifically and, and what does it mean to create a national model of, of healthy eating? And could you tell me, with the new edition, the 2019 edition of Canada's Food Guide, what do you see as the main changes? Um, well, I see the movement away from the total diet model of, of eat this many specific servings of these specific um, foods as a, a pretty substantial change. Um, so there's there's a more... there's a sort of a simplification of the advice. Um, you know, the advice, the, the plate model is much more visual, uh, much more intuitive, I think, than, than the version that was developed in the 1990s. Um, and there's an attempt to acknowledge the sort of the social elements of eating um, mm -hmm. much more than previous guides and, and to, to sort of implicitly acknowledge the, the sort of cultural biases in the old guides. Um, but it does share some of the problems with the old guide of, of telling, and this is true from 1942 on, of telling people, um, that this is what you need to do healthy when for a lot of the people who are really the people who, um, are most in need of, of, of help, the people whose diets are the least healthy, the barriers to, to eating a healthy diet aren't educational, they're structural. And so, you know, in the new guide, for instance, telling people to, to cook and eat more meals at home. Um, when you're telling someone who's working multiple jobs to support their family to do this, that becomes an impossibility. And so once again, like previous guides, it often provides an, an, um, an impossible vision for, for the people who really are most in need of help. And so a food guide in the absence of actual structural um, means for people to eat these kinds of foods, whether that's national school lunch programs, whether that's improved social social assistance rates, um, whether that's, you know, changes to labor laws, it becomes a model of, well, that would be great. I would love to eat like that, but I, it's simply impossible. Thank you. And last, um, is there, before we close this interview, is there anything else you'd like to share about the evolution of Canada's food guide? Well, I think, you know, one of the most interesting elements of it is, you know, we have the evolution of the name of the food guide from Canada's official food rules to Canada's food guide. Um, but there is an element of official rules to, to the food guide from the very start. Um, and there's, there's, you know, th this was always criticized from from the start from from critics of the food guide, both both within the nutrition professions and from outside, um, about what it means to give people these these rules for living, um, coming from from state bodies, whether it's Health Canada or um, at the time, you know, in 1942, the Department Department of National Health and Welfare, um, and so it is it is worth thinking about. I think for nutrition professionals to think about. Um, how much that sort of a rules-based message is capable of actually influencing individuals to make better choices, um, especially in the context when their choices are so constrained by, by their everyday life, by lack of funds, by, by lack of time, um, all of these different issues. And so, you know, one of the questions I, I, I think it's always worth asking is why a food guide? Um, and, you know, have we spent too much time talking about, um, 
something that that is maybe inherently very much too problematic to to uh, be helpful to individuals as opposed to as as a guidance for 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 nutrition professionals who who I think have always used the food guide and always have found it helpful uh, in their work and so there's always this tension between the food guide as um, a guide for public policy um, as a guide for for training nutrition professionals and, and health professionals versus it as a guide for actually um, organizing an individual's diet. And I think there, there's that tension has always been there. And I think it continues to be there in, in the new food guide, which is much improved over previous versions of the food guide. But there is always that, that tension at the heart of food guidance of, you know, is this where we should be putting our effort when we know the causes of malnutrition are often structural? Um, rather than educational.